Thanksgiving, I've thought uh, recently, you know, I don't remember seeing one Thanksgiving thing in any stores. I haven't been in many stores, but I, I don't remember one. Uh, and I'm not watching much TV, so uh, maybe it is mentioned on TV, uh, but I, I just have heard no reference to it. Thanksgiving is a, a time period, the, the, what it celebrates. Um, uh, I value the wisdom. I wish I had followed it more closely of God and the nation of Israel and that he had them celebrate significant moments in their history year after year after year. And they retold the stories uh, of the Passover and Egypt and God delivering them and the time of traveling in the wilderness and uh, have very elaborate approaches to remembering and recalling and making feasts in some dimensions and gathering of men three times a year in Jerusalem that God emphasized, tell the stories, retell the stories, retell the stories. I, can, I envisioned at some point in time recently uh, dads retelling the stories again with the ways they do them and the children having heard them so many times every year, the cycle every year, uh, I could almost imagine dads calling on the children and what happened next and they could tell you what happened next because those stories were reiterated over and over and over again. Great wisdom in that. I've done it some, but I sure haven't done it as much as uh, this particular week as I've thought about those things. Boy, I wish I did. Um, so I want to reflect on, uh, I'm going to reflect on our Thanksgiving, meaning by that the first Thanksgiving of America and uh, the events that took place. I find it personally a tremendously encouraging story, and it's one of the stories that shows the hand of God, the planning of God uh, in both dimensions. Years ago, I saw a movie called uh, Vantage Point, and it showed an event that took place and kept rewinding the clock and going to a different group of people or, and showed what did they do from that exact time period, let's say 12 to 1. And then they would rewind the clock again, and they would show a different group. And what did they do between 12 and 1 as the whole story culminated called Vantage Point? I love that idea. I often say, <clears throat> how did God do that? How did he bring that together? For instance, you heard me say several weeks ago, I, I wonder how God brought the Sumners here I'm not going to go through again the things I said, but I mentioned that multiple times that day, uh, that time period. I, just, I really wonder how they came, and I found out. I don't know how many of you know, they live across the street of a man by the name of Louis Jolliger. And Louis Jolliger told them about this church uh, that he went to, except when they came, they found out he wasn't going here any longer and wondered, where's Lewis? So, um, so I went, now, God, how'd you do that? Now, how did they get to that street where they were across the street? They, were acro they are across the street, neighbors of Lewis. That's another story, so they'll, they'll have to tell that story. But how did they, in a sense, hear about this and, and what was so prompting to them to come? It was Lewis Jolliger. So, um, the first Thanksgiving, that time period. It is such a fascinating story to me. Um, I have spent through the years a lot of time reading very different sources on it. I love the story. I love the impl implications. I love the lessons that can be learned. I love the characters. I love the development of the pilgrims. I think next year I'm going to spend time studying the pilgrims and their journey and in England and then they moved to another country before they eventually began their journey. And uh, I, I intend to study out the pilgrim from, the, from before they started crossing the water. Because um, this, this will focus on, um, I, and I've written down some names just to help me to try and cover some of the po points. It begins, I'll say, in the mind and heart of God when he destined, there's going to be a land there, it's going to be America. And uh, that's what it's going to be. And he wanted to establish, these are my opinions, he wanted to establish a record at the get-go, at the very beginning. I know there was um, a, a, 
uh, uh, a planting uh, of a group of people uh, uh, south of uh, New England prior to this, and it's uh, a lost colony. We don't know what happened to those people. Uh, but in this instance, um, it's like God prepared <clears throat> a people. He prepared a people who had a passion. And they were pilgrims, and they were over in Europe. They had a passion, and they wanted to serve God, and they wanted to serve God outside of the, uh, the boundaries, the, um, the shackles, so to speak, of the religious spiritual system that they found themselves being oppressed by. And they were so fed up with it that they chose eventually they were going to risk everything and they were going to cross the ocean and they were going to seek to establish a new land. They'd had enough. They were fed up. Uh, but that's a story. That'll be next year's story. This year, uh, it's been several years, I think, since I've given some of this detail of our first Thanksgiving as a nation and what it says about God's provision. In my mind, it starts in the mind of God, but when it began to be manifested, there was a very, very warlike Indian tribe that was um, in Plymouth, in the area that we now recognize and identify as Plymouth. And one of the Indians of that tribe was a young man named Squanto, or Tisquantum. Sometimes you'll read it Tisquantum, sometimes you'll read it Squanto. And he was a member of this tribe, extremely fierce, extremely warlike. I have read that two times he went across the, uh, uh, the ocean and came back. Uh, I've read a couple that said three times he went across and came back. I probably, I think it was twice, and... Um, in 1605 was the first time that uh, he, was, he was taken uh, from America or from the shores of what we now refer to New England because he was a messenger and he was a provision that God equipped so that when the pilgrims came over who were very ill-equipped to deal with what they were going to be dealing with, <clears throat> God was in the process, and this is our country, <clears throat> God was in the process of preparing a messenger a vehicle, a servant, a provision. And uh, so there's those two stories. There's the provision that God was working on preparing. Uh, among things, he had to speak English. Among things, it was beneficial that he was an Indian and lived in that area of the country, so he understood dwellings and how to build dwellings and crops and fishing and understood all those things. But he hadn't learned English, while obviously, while he was in... Uh, the United States when he was in, in this tribe that lived really near the coast um, and was a very warlike tribe. Sometime around 1605, he was taken to England. Some resources say he was taken captive. He was tricked uh, aboard to trading ships that sometimes came up and down the coast. And some say that he went voluntarily, willingly. I don't know. Uh, but he was taken to England approximately in 1605. And in um, 1614, he spent time in various places, but the last place he stayed, at least the records are, in the home of a very wealthy merchant uh, man in England. And it was very beneficial for him, and he learned English exceptionally well. But he longed to go back home. He longed to come back to the United States. So this is the person, the provision, that God is preparing just like God prepared Louis Jolliger to be a provision, to be a messenger that he was going to speak to Roger and Susan and say, well, let me tell you about the church that I go to. At least I, don't, I think he presented it that way, New Covenant Fellowship. And um, it was, he wanted to go home. Squanto the Indian wanted to go home. And he was going home with something different. He understood uh, English culture to some degree, and he spoke English to some significant degree. And he went back, so back to England, back to the United States, and he was taken by two men, Captain John Smith and Captain Thomas Hunt, in 1614, back to the United States. And uh, Captain John Smith was the boat that he traveled on. This was pre-Pilgrims. It was the boat he traveled on. Captain John Smith uh, led him off. Eventually, they did some uh, going up and down the coast of New England. And uh, eventually, he led him off. And it is told that Captain Thomas Hunt who was a mercenary and who was dabbling in the slave market, had very different intentions for Squanto and other Indians of that time. 
and after Captain John Smith had uh, released him uh, back to his home, uh, Thomas Hunt came nearby, and as least as the stories told, that he lured Squanto and several other Indians, a number of other Indians, onto his boat with the pretense of trading with them. And when they got him on the boat, however they did it, whatever happened, uh, they um, surrounded them and uh, took him captive again and took him back across the ocean again. So here's a young man who could easily say, if I don't know what kind of thoughts he thought, but could easily say, my life is a waste, nothing is working out, what in the world is wrong? But I'm thinking in 2017 terms, uh, you know, 16, 14, 16, 15, I don't know what the thought patterns would have been uh, for someone who was an Indian, but captured again just after he got back home, had to be heartsick about it, had to be angry, had to be very frustrated, having no idea that really God was preparing him. Uh, do I think God uh, had the aggressiveness of Thomas Hunt, that that was God's purposes and so on? No, I always believe God's purposes are good. Um, and why God had him back? Uh, according to the books, he had to become a Christian. He hadn't become a Christian yet. So he went back with Thomas Hunt, approximately 1614. Um, and he was sold as a slave to, in Spain. Uh, when they got back, Thomas Hunt got to Spain area. They sold him to some, uh, some uh, priests, uh, Spanish. I'm assuming they were Catholic, Spanish, Catholic priests. And he was sold into kind of a monastery environment where he was taught Christianity, uh, at least as it was taught at that point in time. And supposedly, he converted to Christianity. He heard about Christ, and he accepted Christ. He made his way back up to England uh, again, and about six months before the pilgrims came across in their journey, uh, the, the people that he was with, uh, a Detmer, the people that he was with when he finally went back to England, uh, they arranged passage for him, and he got passage back to the United States, and about six months before the pilgrims arrived, um, he returned to uh, his, uh, the area where his tribe used to be, this incredibly warlike tribe. And they were mysteriously wiped out by some kind of a fever. And the literature says that none of the other tribes of that area uh, came and took the land that was left when that tribe was all, uh, all died out. And this was prior to... Um, uh, Squanto coming back to America for the second time, at least it could have been a third time, um, they, because they were, they were afraid that some great spirit had caused this to occur and had wiped out that incredibly warlike tribe, and they weren't about to occupy that territory again. And so when the pilgrims arrived, it was relatively ready for people to build and to grow crops there because of this previous Indian tribe. Squanto, when he found out, when he got back, about six months before the pilgrims arrived, he uh, joined with another tribe, that Mazawat uh, was the king of, a, of another tribe, and he just, not far away, and that's where he stayed. Meanwhile, back in England, the pilgrims, and I, don't, I, I can't tell the story uh, what happened on that end, I will next year. Uh, meanwhile, they... Uh, signed up, in essence, with two boats, and they were named the Speedwell and the Mayflower. I have read that the Mayflower actually was a wine ship, meaning it was made to carry wine. That's interesting if that if that's really was the case, and God was bringing, in essence, the new wine that he was bringing to this country, that he was overseeing the founding of it, because he wanted a stamp, a mark to be there so clear that God was the one who made provision. Where does the first Thanksgiving come out of? It comes out of a, a profound realization that this man, Squanto, that they haven't met yet, was the provision of God, and what they experienced, they were so thankful for, it was out of that provision that God made in an Indian, Squanto, Squanto who paid quite a price. Quite a price. And was used of God. Uh, I wonder what the awards are uh, that Squanto will gain 
when he got when in heaven. That's just almost amazing to me. Uh, the Speedwell had many leaks. That boat, uh, they were going to sail. Uh, the pilgrims, when they set sail, they were going to sail in um, the, the Mayflower. The Speedwell was also going to go. It had to turn back uh, because it was leaking so badly, and only one boat made it across. There was a horrific storm as they were going across. They intended to go to Virginia. That's where the pilgrims were set for. And there was such a tremendous storm that they encountered on their journey in the Atlantic that they were blown quite a bit north and um, almost to Newfoundland. And then they came down, and it was winter, and it was 1620, and it was the late in the fall of the winter of 1620, and they landed at uh, what we now call, call to and refer to as Plymouth. And they went out and they claimed it for God, claimed it. Little did they know that God had been working way ahead of time, making his provision. The first year, there was about, uh, the numbers are about, there was about 103, 105 people that eventually went on shore, 1620. That first winter, just in those first few months of the first winter, approximately 50 people, 47, 48, 49, approximately 50, 50 people died. So their number was cut in half. It was terrifying. They were beginning to have Indian sightings. And as William Bradford wrote in his journal, there was a day in March, actually March 16 of 1621, that the men were gathered in a building that was their, kind of their common meeting place, and the purpose of the meeting was to decide, there had been several Indian sightings, what were they going to do about the Indians? How would they handle themselves if the Indians came, attacked? According to Bradford's journal, while they were actually having that meaning, the timing of God. In the camp walked an Indian brave, um, a, a tall, uh, muscular Indian brave, let's say dressed in the minimal Indian uh, dress, and we'll just leave it like that. Samoset, the, the, the Indian's name was Samoset. The records say he carried in his hand a bow and two arrows. One of the arrows was tipped, as it would have been. One of the arrows, the tip had been removed. So he was carrying a bow and two arrows, one essentially useless, one that could be used in a fight. We have been told that that had great meaning. It was very deliberate, it was very purposeful, and it, the statement that it was making was, if you have come for war, you will find war. If you have, the broken tipped one, if you have come for peace, you will find peace. What you have come for, you will find. He spoke very minimal English. He had learned his English from um, not travelers, but uh, people who sold goods and traders. He had learned minimal, very simple English from traders who had come up and down the coast for a number of years. And they... They accepted him from the standpoint, they welcomed him in, they discussed and they talked with him, tried to understand him. First thing they did was they tried to clothe him so he wasn't so uh, void of clothing. And um, then they had the meeting. And uh, that was the 20, that was the 16th. That was March the 16th of 1621. On the 22nd, on, on March the 22nd, so four, six days later, uh, Samoset came back, but he had someone with him, uh, and he had a, a, a man that God had been preparing, and he was an Indian whose name was Squanto, who spoke English fluently. Can you imagine when the pilgrims understood the story that they realized they were so over their head. They had no idea how to make it work where they were. But they couldn't tolerate where they were any longer. 
and for the sake of God and their families, they were willing to subject themselves to such a change. Little did they know that God, years in advance, had been preparing someone who knew the area, who knew the cultures, who knew how to build and garden and fish, and who knew how to do that, who could help them. It's a fabulous story. Sadly, you don't hear it. So two Indians came six days later. Samoset by himself, six days later, Samoset brought another. His name was Squanto. Squanto. They quickly discovered Squanto had an incredible vocabulary and somehow along the way heard his story of his multiple trips, whether they looked at that as the provision of God as they began to hear the story, or after all of it took place, I don't know. I find it, when I look at our culture, our country, the development of our country, and if someone asked, do you believe God was involved in the development of our country, I would ask, do you believe that Joseph, God was involved in Joseph going to Egypt uh, to rescue the nation of Israel when a time of terrible drought would come? I think most people would say yes. I certainly say yes. God was involved in the story of Squanto. Um, they had conversation, basically, uh, king Masawad, who was the king of the nearby tribe, wanted to establish a peace treaty with them because he was not a warlike king. He was not of that other uh, na uh, tribe that Squanto actually was, was born in. And so he sent Squanto back with um, Samoset because Squanto was such a good interpreter uh, to establish a peace treaty. They did. Eventually, they did. That peace treaty lasted 50 years. Not one pilgrim was killed during those 50 years from Indians that the peace treaty had been made with. It stood 50 years. So the story is that in that spring and summer, Squanto chose to uh, stay in, with the pilgrims. And he taught them how to fortify their homes so they were much warmer in uh, the colder climate. Uh, he taught them how to plant corn, when to plant corn. He taught them how to fish, taught them to prepare crops. And so they did. They had an abundant crop that year. And somewhere along the line, they were so thankful for what God had done, how he had worked in their lives, that inside of them arose such thanksgiving for the store of food that they had, recognizing the hand of this Indian Squanto. Uh, this this uh, edition is found in William Bradford's, one of his journals. He wrote uh, later that Squanto was, and this is how it's written in his journal, a special instrument sent by God for their good beyond their expectations. They recognized the hand of God. They recognized, God, you did this. Can you explain everything that happened to Squanto and all that? No, I, I can't explain all that. I, I just can't explain all that. But they came to recognize at that time in their history, in the development of the, the beginning of this colony um, of pilgrims, that William Bradford, uh, one of the leaders, saw Squanto was a special instrument sent by God for their good beyond their expectations. It's interesting, I forgot, there's a humorous story when um, Santos, uh, not Squanto, but the Samoset, the first Indian, came uh, with his bow and two arrows, one tipped, one not. Um, he said, uh, he greeted them in, um, in English, his very broken English, welcome, and uh, at least Bradford has written that his next question was, have you any beer? Um, but I won't tell you that, you understand, because that's not very spiritual, you understand. Um, but Samo said he didn't have that journey. 
over to England and back and over to Spain and then England and then back again, at least two trips. If he was, Squanto was a special instrument sent by God for their good beyond their expectations. It's an incre- he died in uh, 1622. Various different stories about him, but he died just two years later. Squanto. Um, I, I think of these things, these are lessons that I think at a minimum can come out of the first Thanksgiving. Yes, we are told that uh, the pilgrims established several days of festivity out of be, giving special thanks to God, reading Bradford's uh, journal. Uh, they decided to give thanks to God for his abundant provision. And so they opened their food stores and I think on the fourth day, uh, King Massawat with 90 of his braves showed up and they promptly, they brought with them five deer. Everything I read says that's what they brought. They brought with them five deer and entered into several more days of feasting and that was the real first Thanksgiving. And they ate together, they uh, played games together. Um, It was a festive time. But it was because in their hearts, they wanted to give thanks to God for what he had done. Because during the first few months of the first winter, their numbers decreased in almost 50%. Not technically, but practically. They lost half of them and had no idea, how are we going to make it? And in walks this nearly naked Indian saying, welcome, do you have any beer? And the story started. And six days later was to come this messenger, special messenger of God by the name of Squanto. It's an amazing story. I think every bit, I think as the Hebrew fathers would gather their families for, and talk about uh, the exodus and talk about the death angel that came in Egypt and talk about the plagues and talk about the lamb and the blood on the door. I'm sure they talked about Joseph and how God had sent Joseph and made provision. I think I could almost see the group of children around the dads as they were. And who did God send ahead of time? And I can almost just hear it, just in my imagination, all of the little Hebrew children saying, Joseph! I almost can hear, and I'm asking you to respond with the right name. So in your house your dad, that he had gathered you, uh, and every Thanksgiving, I don't know how many times, I have four years, five years, I have told this story, um, uh, uh, and I caved at the looks of boredom from some of my grandchildren that you've told this story before. Um, uh, I wasn't, I'm a little wiser now in that particular thing than I was then. But if us in retelling, and that's the story I would tell, I would tell the story of Squanto. I love the story of Squanto. And I would say, if I had him circled around, and you know, God had prepared a special messenger for the pilgrims that they had no idea that he was working in advance so that when they came and those that survived the first window, winter, they eventually encountered an Indian by the name of what? One, two, three. By the name of who? One more time. They encountered an Indian who helped them profoundly. And they came to recognize he was an instrument of God prepared for good for them beyond all expectations. And his name is what? Squanto. So I see these lessons, and there are many that can be extracted from this. Before the journey even begins, God is preparing people and a place for us and for his purposes. I believe these are lessons that come from the very beginning of our country in terms of the pilgrims coming over and establishing, so to speak, a beachhead. And God had prepared a person, Squanto, to enable them to do it. It's of great value to understand that story in and of itself. You won't hear it in your schools in general. 
you won't hear it on your TVs unless it's a very unusual program. You won't see it in our stores right now uh, because they're filled with Christmas things. But what I take from it in looking at that time period, what was going on? And that's how God founded our country. Is it possible that that's what God does in our lives? And I see this lesson before the journey even begins. God is preparing people and a place for us and his purposes. God was, pre was preparing. The same is true for us. Actually, he had the experience this week um, that several pastors in the city came to me and asked if they could buy our building. Buy our building. And I said, well, the way I look on this is like a biblical story. This is what I told him. It's like a biblical story. It's like Gideon. I said, Gideon was a man, and when God encountered him, um, that he sent an angel, God sent an angel, and encountered him, and he was threshing wheat, taking care of wheat, and he was hiding from this, this named people, the Midianites, for fear because they were ravaging the land. And what God's intentions were, were to take him eventually from hiding out in that ca caved in, carved out rock area that was a wine press, and that he would lead, be willing to stand and lead as many people as God had picked, ended up being 300, that he would stand on the rim, the edge of, that surrounded all the Midianites, and they would have in their hands a torch, a pitcher, uh, a clay pot, and uh, a shofar. We would call it a trumpet. It's, it was most likely a shofar. And they would stand there, and on his cue, he would um, blow the shofar, break the clay pot, and the torch would come out. And I said, if you went and asked Gideon, was he willing to sell his torch, sell the clay pot, and sell the shofar uh, to them? Um, and I think Gideon would have said, no, these are the resources that God has given to me uh, that we are to utilize for what the assignment that he has given us. Sell the property? How could we do that? The answer was no. We're not interested in selling the property. God prepared. So you're pleased. Well, good. One of you's pleased. I'm glad. Otis was pleased. I had Otis with me, so he was pleased. Before the journey even begins... Then and now in our own lives. Before the journey even begins, God is preparing people and a place for us and his purposes. It's very biblical. He did it with Joseph. Extremely biblical. He prepared him. He, uh, he revealed his assignment in two dreams to him. Very uh, not capable of understanding. What, what's the full ramification of this? I don't know, but... Here's the dreams. I know his brothers hated it. Even his dad questioned him when he said the second dream. But God prepared him. Then he went through a training process. Because the day would come that he would occupy the place, the role that God had prepared him for. We are being prepared for a role. And that role in its fullest is when the harvest comes in. And he's given us the privilege of playing a strategic role in the launch of the end time harvest. But the real intention is the harvest. And this is a place that he said, when the harvest comes in, here it's going to be healed, delivered, sent forth, filled, sent forth with power, and they won't waver. That's the calling. That's what's ahead of us. That's what it would be, ant it would be awful to sell the property. Beware, be before the journey even begins, God is preparing people and a place for us, for you and his purposes. He's preparing people. Number two, what I take from then and now. The development of people and place takes time. It takes time. People and place. It takes time. The place where the pilgrims were going to go was a, 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 the most warlike anti-European, one of the things I read was anti-European warlike tribe that existed in the New England area. Right where they landed. 
they would have been massacred. God understanding things ahead of time. There was provision that was made. God understood they will have to have insight, information beyond what they know. So he prepared someone who was a perfect, but he didn't speak English. And so there was a journey. While they were dealing with all the things they were dealing with back in England, and Holland, I think Holland, they moved to Holland uh, for a time period before they came across the ocean. God's working on Squanto, and he's educating him in the ways of the Europeans and to speak English and was presenting the claims of the gospel of Christ, Jesus Christ. He was preparing a servant who would, he would use and the development. Why do things take time? One of the reasons things take time is the development of people and place or places takes time. The place for you, the place that God has. The place where the pilgrims were going to first land. The needs that they had. God knows ahead of time. And this is before they ask, I will answer. And there are times in your life you bump into these kinds of provisions and you recognize you knew what's so healthy. You knew ahead of time what I was going to encounter or what needs I would have. You knew ahead of time. There is no other explanation other than you say it was serendipitous, it was chance. Or you are able to say, you did that, you were aware your handprint is all over this. Preparing the place, preparing the opening, preparing the people. It takes time. A lot of years in Squanto's case. But God was at work. He was at work before they even remotely understood the pilgrims. We're going to have some pretty big needs when we get there. Number three, from then and now, God's shaping of our lives is not on hold during the time we are unaware of Him and His purposes. There are so many times people think, I'm in a desert place, nothing is happening. I can't see anything. I have no idea. And you can look at the founding of our nation, which we will celebrate this week, but largely not celebrate as a nation. And you could say God's shaping of our lives is not on hold during the time we are unaware of Him and His purposes. You could say when things aren't working out or things have seemed to stagnate, why can't, um, I, I've read enough to know when they were in Holland and they really wanted to go and there was such danger involved and that for the pilgrims before they actually left the country. Little did they know that one of the reasons things took so much time is because Squanto had to get back over to America because he was who God has chosen. And just six months before they arrived, he arrived back from his two or three round trips to Europe, at least two. And they could say, it's just on hold. Everything's on hold. From this story, I glean, just because it looks like it's on hold doesn't mean it's on hold at all. There may be another dimension of what will become a part of the story, the journey that you're on, that that's what God is. That's what's being emphasized at that time period. You are being examined, possibly, will you hold steady? But I can't see anything seemingly to develop. Will you hold steady? I take that from this story because we've had the opportunity through William Bradford's journals, through so much of the history we are told, not from the modern day retelling that is taking place in our schools, 
and in our stores and on our televisions. It's such an attempt to erase the reality of God is the one who provided. And that first Thanksgiving was a celebration of, a, I believe, a deep realization that just resonated. We are making it because God moved. He actually started moving back in, let's say, 1605. Because God moved. That's how we made it. It was because of God. In 2011, most of you are unaware, well, those of you who are new, we went through a time of great um, attack. During early in the summer, starting in May, June, I felt to call a 40-day fast. We have had many 40-day fasts, three, four of them. It was the first and only, I've done one day, three days. I've done total fast for three days, but water only fast, I may have done a week once. I've never done 40 days. But I was just impressed that day, and prior to that fast, you need to do a 40-day water fast. And I led the congregation because we were, it was desperate times for us. This was 2011. Did a 40-day fast, a water fast. I thought I was going to die on the last few days of that fast. Uh, I recommend if you do that, make sure God's leading you to do it. 40 days after that fast was over, I was working on a trailer right out here in the parking lot, and somehow I was shoveling mulch out of the, out of the trailer, very loose, non-clay mulch. I backed into a short wall on the trailer. I was up on the trailer and pirouetted over backwards and fell on my head on the asphalt. I had two doctors tell me, you should have died. I injured my brain stem. I damaged the vestibular canal on my, behind my right ear. Not too many weeks later, we had a horrific uh, lateral windstorm that the sign, the wooden sign, not the lighted sign, the wooden sign out on the entrance island, um, it's made out of mahogany. Mahogany is a straight grain wood. Uh, the wood was built so that it runs the, uh, not up and down on the side, right to left. And just above there's posts, there's two posts on each end um, that clasp onto that sign. And just above those posts, that's the top of that sign that said New Covenant split off and was on the ground from this horrific windstorm. And one of the trees, our na this neighbor in this white house, had two good-sized trees in the front yard. One of the trees was completely un unearthed. The other one stood as if nothing happened. It was such a directed horizontal wind shear storm. Not long after that, a semi-truck decided it would turn around in our entrance island. I'm sure you have seen cars turn around in our entrance island. A semi tried to turn around in the entrance island and his rear wheels rolled over the top of that pillar and that pillar has 77 stones. It represents God moved through 77 people to provide the funds for us to buy the property that we're on. It has great meaning to us. It was a memorial that we built to God. About a year after I fell, we were going to have a conference here with Katie Sousa and uh, as they were picked up at the airport, she and the gal who was traveling with her uh, on Alcoa Highway, there's a Kia dealership there. Um, some people suggested, I wonder if that meant killed in action. Uh, there was a car that ran a stop sign and ran right into the car, Gary Beaton's car, who was driving them. Gary called me on the phone and said, Russ, uh, I've, I've picked up Katie Sousa. She's on the ground. We've been hit in an accident. And she's screaming, I'm dying, I'm dying, I can't breathe. And I said, Gary, come on, this is not a good time to joke. No, no, really, it, this has happened. They named, Katie Sousa and her uh, team, they named the conference Global Army Arising. They, they named that. It was not time. I believe they're alive because, in part, we fasted 40 days. I believe because it was 40 days after, I believe I'm alive still because of the sovereign intentions of God. And I believe 
that God used somehow, some way, that 40 day of fasting. So during that time period, and uh, God, uh, you know, when the devil does things, one of the things that the scripture says is things are thrown on the ground, um, that they fall to the ground. The sign fell to the ground. The, the pillar was crushed to the ground. I fell to the ground. Katie and Gary, Katie was on her back on the ground. It, that was the work of Satan. That wasn't the work of God. God understood it ahead of time. And he moved preemptively because it was such a big deal, had so much at stake. So much at stake. So I see from the first Thanksgiving story and from our lives and from my life and from Bible stories, I see that God's shaping of our lives is not on hold during the time we are unaware of him and his purposes. I mean, what's not on hold is that he's, it's like, okay, he's forgotten me and he set me aside. He doesn't even know that I exist anymore. And he's working someplace else in the world, maybe a different country. Or maybe we'd hear about in our country, it's always on the West Coast. He's working on the West Coast of the United States. He's not doing anything on the East Coast or Tennessee. Uh, for years, we used to say and think that. God, why is it always on the West Coast? And could have in our minds the thinking, well, God's shaping of our lives, he, it's on hold because He's now working on, the, he's always working on our lives. Part of the reason is because the people and the place that we are to occupy is being prepared and shaped. It's not ready. Number four, our own chosen destination is not always God's destination for us. They wanted to go north, I mean south. They wanted to go to Virginia, the pilgrims. When the pilgrims set sail, their intention was to go to Virginia. At sea, and so as all that developed, the provision that God had for them was in New England. That's where the provision was. It's a simple matter. God causes a storm, strong wind blows that boat, uh, the Mayflower blows it farther north than it intended, so it ends up, they come to Plymouth. And that's where the land is for them that's been prepared by a tribe that thankfully is no longer there. But the land has been prepared. And that's where the messenger that God had prepared, the special messenger that God had prepared, that's where he was. So I see from that, our own chosen destination is not always God's destination for us. Faye and I, when we first started thinking about starting New Covenant, um, there was a Patty uh, Dotson dealership on I-75. It's where many big trucks, uh, UPS parks, uh, some of their trucks. And it had had a fire, and it had burned, and it was just standing there in a burned condition. And Faye and I were sure, and we called for it. We named it. Uh, we, we said, uh, you're God's future church. We All kinds of things. That's where we had picked. Well, God had picked this property. We picked another property. God picked this one. Sometimes our own chosen destination is not always God's destination for us. Why do I believe we as Americans should be willing to consider such a thing? Because of our history. Because of how God began our nation. It has meaning, thanksgiving, this week. Number five, God-centeredness is the breeding ground for thanksgiving. God-centeredness. It wasn't luck. It wasn't, it wasn't the work of their hands. I wonder what the second message is going to be like, because this was just the before. Uh, God-centeredness is the breeding ground for thanksgiving. It's the breeding ground. They came to a recognition. William Bradford came to the recognition. God, you provided that Indian squanto. He was a special instrument prepared by you. You sent him. It's beyond our expectations. You did. I see this point. 
God-centeredness. And out of that realization, out of the God-centeredness, they had the provision that they had. They had the crops that they had. They had the store. They had homes that were far more capable of withstanding the winter blasts. So they had a time of thanksgiving because they were acknowledging, God, you pick the place, you pick the time, you pick the special messenger, you picked all that. This is your hand. Every one of us, you can look back on your story, your lives, and as if, if, as you have said yes to God, you can look back and you're Americans, you can see these things in your own life. They're biblical. The first Thanksgiving. So, uh, Sunday morning, November 19th, the focus of the message is Thanksgiving. Uh, one of my favorite, probably my favorite passage in the Bible is Romans 1, 20 and 21. I'll finish with this. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes are clearly seen. It's speaking that this world has been created. And it's been created by God, who is invisible. But those attributes of this invisible God are clearly seen. His complexity, his um, diversity is clearly seen by the things that have been created. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. What is it? His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The whole world has the record of the world. The heavens fall into it. The constellations fall into it. The galaxies fall into it. The cells fall into it. The more our knowledge increases, the more magnificent the creation becomes, the ecosystems, how God created it. And then my single favorite verse is Romans 1.21 because it tells me how to live. It tells me what God's desire is. Because although they knew God, they made two mistakes or made two decisions. We as a culture are making these same decisions. Everybody around you is making these kinds of decisions. What were the decisions? They did not glorify him as God, God the creator. They did not glorify God the creator as God, nor were they thankful. The two things, what I believe are the two pillars, foundations of you're going to live the kingdom. It is glorifying God as God, Jesus as the Christ. His provision is sufficient. Glorify God as God and be thankful. Be thankful to God for they were. Do I think they understood the whole journey when they were crossing the ocean, when it took so long to leave Europe, when they landed and nearly 50% of them died the first few months? No. But they came to a place where they were able to give thanks and gave rise to the first Thanksgiving that we will celebrate the memory of it. But became, uh, they did not glorify God as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. I intended to say to you, we are to live, Romans 8, 5, for those who live according to the flesh, what they see, what they feel, what appears before them, what they're able to do, what they can make work, what can I do, how they can fix it. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. God's involved in my life. He has been working. I believe he has led me to this place, then there is adequate here to accomplish what he has called me to. This one thought, I um, uh, I wanted this one, Matthew 11. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that you have hidden these things from the wise. That's not the one I wanted. And he took the, uh, this is the one I want. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks. And he broke them. This is when Jesus was feeding those uh, at a meal. And uh, he had seven loaves one time and some fish. And he broke them and he gave thanks. And the fish, and he gave thanks. And this thought crossed my mind this morning. He gave thanks for what he had to work with. Because he knew he was living in the spirit. He knew that his father, that he could make what he had, what he was given to work with, that it was adequate because he wasn't living according to the flesh. He was living according to the spirit. It was enough. He gave thanks for it. He gave thanks for all those, how many thousand of people and seven loaves, seven fish, seven loaves. And he took the seven loaves and the fish and he, he gave thanks, broke them and gave them to his disciples. He was thankful. But his thankfulness extended to God. His Father, this is what you've given me. I am thankful for it. And I'm looking to you now to make it to be enough, more than enough, for what is necessary to accomplish what you've called us to. It's interesting how many of the Gospels, how many times they refer to this particular instance of that Jesus gave thanks. And if you bow your heads with me. You're going to celebrate Thanksgiving this week. We as a nation are going to try and pass over Thanksgiving as quickly as we can so we can get on to Christmas. Thanksgiving. Glorifying God as God and being thankful. The lesson of Thanksgiving is they came to realize they had gotten where they were. They had made it because of the provision of God that he set in motion before they even knew to ask or what to ask for that God was providing. He knows you. He knows everything you need. So what you have, what's been given to you, you can glorify God with that, and you can be thankful, knowing that in order to accomplish what he's called you to, he will have to increase it, multiply it, stretch it, make it go longer, adapt it, and he's good at that. We sang songs worship, that were filled with worship of God, being thankful and worshiping him. My encouragement to all of us is we would be a people who are filled with thanksgiving while we await his giving and his changing and bringing us into the season that he has promised us.